seen a little bit uh, about my rowing career and what rowing looks like. Um, what I want to do in the time I've got available is talk a little bit about the ingredients that we had as individuals and coming together as teams in order to succeed on uh, the world stage or 10 kilometers down the road. Uh, Gretchen was saying how difficult it is uh, for you guys to judge success, uh, not so in Olympic sport. Uh, this is my medal collection. Um, so if we start off over here, this is the gold from 1992. It's more than a quarter of a century ago. It makes me feel very old. Um, so that was Barcelona 1992. Uh, in a two-man boat uh, with a guy called Steve Redgrave, who got into the video just briefly. Um, he won five. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even, even before we were uh, finished that campaign and finished that race, we were saying, this is great, we want to carry on. The next games, we knew, of course, at that stage was going to be Atlanta, 96. Uh, so we bookended and planned to go from one game to the next and try and win every race in between the two, which we also managed to achieve, which made it doubly difficult. Um, after Atlanta in 96, uh, Steve, my rowing partner, uh, initially said he was going to retire. Uh, that lasted about three weeks. Uh, and then when he came back out of retirement, um, I said, right, well, if we're going to go on to Sydney, uh, let's do it in a different uh, boat class because we'd just done two campaigns back to back uh, and won them. There was sort of very much the feeling of waiting to lose, being at the top of the tree. Um, so we changed into the four-man boat in time for Sydney 2000. Uh, then Steve did retire. That was his fifth campaign. He did then retire. Uh, and I had one more games left in me, which was Athens 2004, uh, coming here to Lake Skinias to... Uh, uh, race for that, uh, also in the four. Obviously a different combination between Sydney and Athens. Um, and the other thing that you'll see when you see them up close is the design on the front uh, doesn't actually match. Uh, this Athens medal is a lot smaller than the other three. Uh, the design on the Olympic Committee changed uh, from these three uh, to Athens. Um, and there's a reason for that in that there's a uh, the, the traditional design has the Greek goddess Nike, who's the goddess of victory. She sits off to one side of the medal. And then importantly, you'll see it on Atlanta and Sydney over to the right. Uh, there's a small building, or it looks like a big building, with a whole series of arches stacked on top of one another. It looks remarkably like the Roman Colosseum. That's because it is the Roman Colosseum. Um, and that's a mistake because you shouldn't have a Roman building on a Greek medal. And it turned out that when Baron de Coubertin founded and restarted the modern Olympic movement in 1896, uh, he commissioned an Italian to design the medal. <laughs> and as a sort of cheeky, well, historians differ as to exactly how the Colosseum ended up uh, on the Olympic medal. But subsequently, uh, each host city, which essentially, whilst there are some parameters, each host city essentially designs their own medal. Each host city, subsequently to that, had this issue about, right, do we include the Colosseum or not? Uh, Barcelona decided to take it off. Uh, uh, Atlanta had it on. Sydney had it on. And then, of course, the Games came back here uh, to Athens in 2004. And the uh, Greek organizing committee petitioned the IOC and said, right, can we now please end all this and redesign the front of the medal? And they were given permission to do that. And so now Nike is standing uh, in the middle of the medal. And you'll see the design. If you go into downtown Athens, there's the traditional white marble stadium. It's a sort of horseshoe design. It's not a full circle. Uh, that now is on the front of every Olympic medal uh, going forward. So this is now the authoritative design. But my collection spreads from before and uh, afterwards. Now, I'm going to hand these off around the room looking suspiciously around the, uh, around the room. Your challenge is to get them around before I have to go in a couple of hours. Uh, and, and what I want to touch on is winning margins. Uh, my first games in 1992, 
the margin between us as gold medalists and the silver medalists was 4.99 seconds, which is probably the far end of that big screen through to about here. That's about five seconds of rowing in a two-man boat. Uh, four years later, the winning margin in the same boat class and nearly the same opposition was one and a half seconds, which is now probably the length of excellence where it counts. That's about a second and a half. Uh, Sydney 2000, the winning margin was 0.38 of a second. That's now down to probably about that. And then in Athens, we just watched the last section of that race uh, from Athens 2004. The winning margin was eight one hundredths of a second, which uh, you've each got a pad in front of you. It's about the short side of the, uh, of the pad. And those races are all standard distance. They're all 2,000 meters long. If you work in miles, it's about a mile and a bit, not nautical miles, that's different again. But it's a decent, it's about a six minute challenge and it can boil down to that. And you know that going in. And so one of the harshest things about Olympic sports is you have all this time to prepare and think about it and train, and then this tiny, tiny window in which it's going to happen. And so you're having to think about all the different variables to your performance and then execute on quite a high-pressured environment for one thing that's going to be, is this going to go well or not? And for us, having been to one games and won a gold medal, which is great, life-changing, but now you want to do it again, uh, we know that having won a gold medal before, anything other than a gold is going to be a disaster. In our mind, that's what we would consider to be a disaster. And so our barometer for success is very high. Um, and so we start off in a room with probably 30 people, uh, and these are all men. These are all heavyweight men. They're all my size and shape usually. Of course, there is women's rowing and there is lightweight category, but we don't have a mix between heavyweight and lightweight. We certainly don't have a mix between men and women at the moment. That's sort of uh, vaunted going forward, but at the moment that's not happening. Uh, so we're talking men, heavyweight men, and rowing. And there's rowing and sculling as well. Sculling is an oar, uh, uh, a sport where you, or a discipline where you have an oar in each hand. So if you see a single sculler out on the water, they've got an oar in each hand. Uh, for rowing, what we consider sweep rowing, uh, you've just got one. And so for me, I'm a sweep rower, I'm a stroke sider. So even to this day, I still, I'm still very comfortable standing like that. I don't want to go that way. This arm is comfortably longer than this arm. It's like, it just all works that way. Other people, you have to have a matching pair. Obviously in a pair, and then a four, and then an eight. You have to have other ciders, have to have bow ciders to get on with. Um, but we're starting with a room of about 30. Uh, and straight away, there's a tension in the room because there's only 14 plane tickets to the Olympics. And these aren't people who have just walked in off the street. They're already accomplished juniors, university uh, student athletes, uh, probably people who have been to the, some of them, you hope a cohort have been to the games before. And so the start of the meeting will be the chief coach standing up and saying, well, well done to, you know, you guys who are coming back around again, and particularly well done to John and Jeff who won the gold medal at the last Olympics. And there'll be a little polite ripple of applause. And then that's it. And then we move on. Because what we're really there for is about what's to come. We're not that interested in celebrating our success for whoever might have been in the room or what we've achieved before. And the coach will stand there and say, right, this is my starting group for the next four-year cycle running up to the next Olympics. And the next bit of information that he's going to hand out is the gold medal standard. And that's his prediction for the time that the gold medal is going to be won in at the next games. And that for us in, let's take uh, Sydney 2000, we had a meeting towards the end of 1996 
with that room who was aiming for Sydney 2000, the gold medal time was five minutes and 46 seconds. And he produced this on a sheet of paper and the room laughed because it was faster than the world record. It was faster than anyone had been before. It was a jump, a leap forward. And everybody said, well, good on you for having that sort of stretch target. Aim for the stars and you might hit the moon sort of thing. But bluntly, it's unrealistic. It's not going to happen. You know, we should just prepare ourselves that that is, you know, way out there. And he said, we'll see. We'll see. And as that four years went on and that crew came together, I was more and more confident that actually we were capable of doing 546. Now, in order to do a world record time, you need lots of things to happen. You need the weather to be right. There's no cutoff in world records in, in rowing for weather. So you're going to have as strong a following wind as you can manage. You want warm water because that's faster than cold water. You want a good crew. Uh, you want a close race. You're not going to be able to do it in training on your own. And we just didn't have all those uh, ingredients come together. But on training camp, even on our own, where we were doing little segments of the race and in, uh, against the... The stopwatch almost, it was especially getting close to that Sydney Games. I was really sure that we could do that. We go to Sydney and we win. And we didn't row anything like 5.46 because on that particular day, the wind was a headwind, not a tailwind. And I think we won a fraction over six minutes. But we won, importantly. And we were sure that we could do it if it, the conditions had been right. And then we go back to the room. And I'm then there again as one of the senior athletes. I've then got three gold medals you know, sort of in my sock drawer at home and polite riff of applause, and then we're carrying on because the new gold medal times are coming out, and the gold medal time moved from 5.46 to 5.42. Four seconds faster. And you've got to imagine sitting there as an experienced athlete, experienced stroke getting older, because by then I was 29, nearly, nearly 30, and there's no way you can persuade yourself at 29 and 30 that you're going to get fitter and stronger and, you know, bigger. It's just not going to happen. You've got to imagine that you're on a plateau, hopefully, and you're going to use your experience and your tactics, and that's your mindset. And someone's saying, well, that's all, that's great, but now you've got to use all those tactics and experience to go four seconds faster. And I just finished a campaign where we had done everything in our power in order to win. We had left no stone unturned. It wasn't like you get to an Olympics and you think, oh, well, this is great, but we've given it a sort of 60% effort. You do absolutely everything. And then eight weeks later, someone's saying, well, that was great, well done. Now you need to go four seconds faster. We go to Athens, come to Athens and win by this much, but we win. And then I then step back, but there's two guys left over from that combination who went back around for Beijing 2008. And the gold medal time moved from 5.42 to 5.38. Four more seconds. The British crew won in Beijing. We then had a home games in London 2012, same coach. Uh, there was one guy left over from Beijing who went to London. The gold medal time moved from 5.38 to 5.36. Two seconds faster. Three of them stayed on for Rio 2016. The gold medal time went from 5.36 to 5.33. They won. And now we are getting on for a year and a bit uh, from Tokyo 2020. Rio is now a distant memory. And the gold medal ties moved from 5.33 to 5.31. And so people keep saying to me, oh, you must be going back and coaching or advising or consulting or helping, motivating, not really. They are really respectful about what we achieved and what's in the box, but they are trying to go 15 seconds faster. It is an ocean. 15 seconds is sort of me into the corner. I mean, it is mad. If you could take our Sydney boat and turn us back into the shape and fitness and age and speed that we were on that particular day and send us out for Tokyo 2020, we wouldn't be in the top 10, 12, 15 boats in the world. 
forget it, miles away. We're dinosaurs. And the crucial thing is we knew it at the time. That was the challenge. My career was long enough to go over a decade at the top, and there was nothing really that we did at the end that we did at the beginning in the same way. Absolutely nothing. There was nothing of relevance that we did in the early 90s that lasted to 2004. And if I go back now and look at what the rowing team are doing now, there is nothing of relevance that we did in 2004 that's still relevant in 2019. And so if you know it at the time, and you know to stay at the top, you're going to have to evolve, you're going to have to change, and you're going to have to change pretty much everything, then the next logical step is, right, how are we going to change? What are we going to change? And in what order? And how are we going to do it between ourselves? How are we going to talk about this? How are we going to start out on this journey? Because otherwise, we're going to be standing here, and four years from now, we know there's Olympics coming, and we know roughly what speed. Our coach is being very predictable about what speed we have to be on that day. How are we going to get from where we are now to where we need to be? And so we have a daily dialogue about what we want to change. The coach will write up uh, a two-week training program, and it will go up on an A4 sheet into the boathouse, and the gold medal time will go top right with a little circle around it, so it just lives as a reminder. And each day will be broken up into two, maybe three training sessions. And a training session for us out on the water will be uh, between 75 and 95 minutes. And for that 95-minute training block, training session, there'll be two or three things in that training program alone that's written down around the heart rate that we're expected to do the training at, the distance that we've got to go, the number of strokes a minute that we're going to do, uh, and the speed. There's four little immediate feedbacks for that hour between 8 and 9.30 on a cold November morning when we're four years away from the Olympics. There's four measurables. And on top of that, then we're going to stand in the boathouse before we go out on the water, and we're going to say, right, between the four of us, what do we want to achieve? And it won't be distance, it won't be speed, it won't be heart rate. Those are given. It'll be, right, what do we want to pick up from yesterday, or where do we want to start, or what do we want this crew to look like? The rowing stroke is sort of a bit like a golf swing. It uses every part of your body, and everyone has little idiosyncrasies in it. But of course, for a rowing crew to look really effective, you don't want any idiosyncrasies at all. You want everybody to be uniform. You want everyone to be perfectly aligned. And if I slow down that video from the Athens race, the British crew, we as the Brits, have one version of the rowing stroke, and the Canadians have another one. It's slightly different, but it's definitely they are doing the same thing. And the Italians have got another version, and the Kiwis have got another, and the Poles have got another. What you never find winning an Olympic gold medal is a crew of four where one guy's rowing like a Brit, one guy's rowing like a Canadian, one guy's rowing like a Kiwi, and one guy's rowing like an American. That is never going to work. And so what we have to do is say, right, where are we going to start? What are we going to tackle? Which idiosyncrasies are we going to get rid of? Which are we going to make our trademark? And that's a really important discussion. Because not one member of the crew is going to stand there and go, right, it's going to be really easy if everyone just rose like me. I mean, it would be, but no one says that. What you want to do is say, right, I know my idiosyncrasy is this, and that's what I'm going to tackle, and that's what I'm going to change, and I'm going to change it in the time scale of a week or a month or a year. Because if you talk to a, a psychologist about it, once you groove in a habit in your brain, you have a sort of neural pathway, and the more often and more often and more often you do it, it becomes a sort of motorway and it just becomes ingrained. We all know that. It becomes habitual. And in order to change that, it feels a dramatic change. It feels 
unnatural, it feels awful, it feels wrong, and you've, you've got to try and work and work and work to get this other pathway to be the way that becomes automatic for you. Because it's one thing to do it in training, and then of course what happens under pressure is you slip back to your old way. And so this is a multi-year project for us to look for changes which are absolutely tiny. But there's absolutely no way you can stand there and say, I'm pretty good at this. I've got one gold medal or two gold medals or three gold medals in the, in the box. I'm good. Everyone rose like me will be fine. If it isn't broke, don't fix it sort of thing. This was, we, we broke the world record three weeks ago. This will be cool. Just keep doing this. That even now makes me feel uncomfortable just even saying it. It, you could never, never slip back and say, we've done enough. Because the nightmare for us, the nightmare for you is different. The nightmare for us is we get to the end of a campaign, we get to the Olympic finish line, and we lose by whatever margin we want to put in. Let's say it's a small one. We lose by a small margin, and we're standing there on the podium receiving our silver medal, and our brain is saying, you could have done more. If only you'd done this. If only you'd been brave enough to bring this point up. If only you'd change that, if you'd taken responsibility. That is the thing that will cost us sleep. Because, of course, if I as an individual in that crew, uh, if that's what my dialogue in my own head is going to be, it's not only cost me my gold medal, it's cost the three other guys in the crew their gold medal. And that's, that really is what keeps you going when it's cold and dark and winter training and all that year after year after year, is the responsibility to your teammates. And so take it back again to our cold November morning. We're about to go out on the water. Then we really want to contribute towards the plan. Then we're going to be saying, look, this is what I think we should change. This is the item that I think is most important. Uh, this is how we're going to tackle it. And so we go out onto the water, and we've got an agenda. We've got a plan. We're going to tackle it. And we go out there, and we row for 90 minutes. And we go up and down. And there's not an awful lot of time to talk and analyze during that 90 minutes because we're busy hitting a heart rate and a boat speed, and we're training hard, so it's not that easy to talk. And then once we finish, we come back into the boathouse, and the discipline is the oars go away and the boat goes away, and we stand there and we say, right, what was good, what was bad, what could we improve? And the easy steps to that journey are we work out what the best bit was of the session. The last 90 minutes, what was the best bit of rowing? And it might only be a minute, but we need to isolate that minute and say, right, that was great. That was what we want more of. What led up to that minute? How could it be longer? What were the things that I was doing that led to it? What were the things that you were doing? And that's a really nice positive discussion. And then we've also got to be brave enough to say, right, what were the things that didn't go well? What was the worst patch of the outing? Where are we going wrong? How are we going to change what we did wrong? And at that point, you want people who are going to have opinions, who are going to have ideas, who are going to take responsibility. And that's almost the toughest thing in a sports environment, is you're standing there in front of your peers, and you're saying, right, that one's with me. That one won't happen again. I take responsibility. That's not good enough. I can change it. That's on me. And that takes courage. But actually, the flip side is, if you're not willing to take responsibility, then you sort of push it away. And you only need <laughs> one, two, three people in that crew to start divesting themselves of responsibility. And then improvement becomes basically impossible. And so we join all these days and weeks and months together with this mindset where we're going to look for tiny, tiny things that we want to change on a daily basis and join them together into months of improvement and years of improvement. 
until we get to an Olympics. And Athens 2004 was obviously my fourth games. I was under the most pressure individually because it was sort of cumulative. I didn't want to be the one who dropped down a level after three goals. And the night before the race in Athens, we were staying in a hotel not far from here, not as nice as this. But we went downstairs into the sort of conference facility, a bit like this, the night before the race in Athens. And we sat around one of those round tables with our coach. And we said, right, what do we want to happen tomorrow? And we were right up against it because the Canadians had been world champions the year before. The Italians in that race had set the quickest time in the year. They set a world leading time. Uh, we hadn't won a race for three months. Uh, we'd had to change our crew in the run-up to the Olympics. We were really on the back foot. And we laid out a race plan about all the things that we should concentrate on and all the things that we were going to improve or not improve, all the things that we were going to not do as many as the things that we were going to do in a six-minute race. And I can still write you out a chart of the, here's what we must do and here's what we cannot do, plan for that six-minute race. And the race started at 10 o'clock the next day, and at 8 o'clock the night before, James Cracknell, one of our uh, crew members, is saying, I want to change the last call. And the last call, we are four men in a boat, so there's one person doing the talking, and so there's one person who's calling the orders, but they're rowing at the same time, so they can't be a sort of commentator. They're having to shout out, blurt out orders and changes. And the last one is normally last 10 strokes or last 15 strokes of the race when it's the last sprint to the line. And James said, I don't want it to be last 10 or last 15. I want it to be last 30. And last 30 strokes is a long way for your last effort. And the way he explained it is, look, if we're involved in a close race and we do 30 strokes rather than 10 and sprint and count them down in your head all the way down from 30 down to zero, we could overtake a crew if they were a small distance ahead, or if hopefully we're leading, we can expand our margin. And with 30 strokes left in the race, that could be the difference between winning or losing. And actually, we will cross the line having no regrets about giving it everything. We're not going to worry that we could have given more. We said, OK. So 10 o'clock the next day, the race starts. And we're avoiding all the things we said we should avoid. And we're maximizing all the things we said we should maximize. And all the way down the course, the lead is changing backwards and forwards with the Canadians. And coming into the last 300 meters, I was absolutely shattered. But that's normal for rowing. That just is. You're not going to be able to row down an Olympic course thinking, God, this is quite hard work. It's you know all the way down. And sure enough, from behind me, I'm in the back of the boat. so the Sounds coming from behind me. I hear last 30, go. And the Canadians are off to our left, this side. No, they're not. Here they are. They're over here. Get it right. It's on the video. They're on the left. On the right. And we're slightly behind them. And I start counting down 29, 28, 27, 26. And within four or five strokes, we come level. We're slightly ahead. Down into the 20s, 19, 18, 17, 16, 17 and we're gradually stretching out into the lead. I'm thinking, this is good. Last 10 strokes, nine, eight, seven, six, down, three, two, one. This is going to be great. I look over, and we're a long way up on the Canadians, probably between the lecterns. That's about how much of a lead we had. I'm thinking, fantastic. We're going to be able to swim in from here and win, <laughs> because over there, there's the big grandstand, and there should be the big finish tower, and the finish line should just be here. None of that was there. I had to turn my head to see the grandstand and then the finish tower is over there. I thought, that angle's not good. That's wrong. And the problem is that 30 strokes carries you about 300 meters. And he called it at 410. <laughs> so we get to the end of our plan and the end of our energy and the end of everything. And we've got 110 meters left of the race. And in one... Split second, I went from, this is great, we can swim in and win, to, I'm just not going to be able to row another 100 meters. I physically cannot do it. 
And then I made a deal with myself. I said, okay, I know, first of all, I know I'm not going to be able to row 100 meters, so I'm going to stop before the finish line. That was almost my plan, but it was the sort of conclusion I reached. And I thought, if I'm not going to stop before the finish line if we're still ahead of the Canadians, because that'll look really bad on TV. <laughs> That's how psychologically strong I was at that moment. And then I thought, okay, I've got 100, I'm going to row three more strokes, and then I'm going to see where we are. And so I rode three strokes, had a look where we were, and we were still ahead. They'd probably come back to about there. I thought, right, I'll row two more strokes and see where we are. I rode two more, I had another look, and the lead was down to about that. I thought, well, we're still ahead. I thought, I'll row one more stroke, see where we are. Row one more stroke, still ahead. Row one more stroke, still ahead. One more stroke, still ahead. One more stroke. We were back level. And what we took out of them in 30 strokes, we gave back to them in eight or nine. We were that spent. And I looked across again for about the fourth time in 10 seconds. And Barney Williams, the stroke of the Canadian boat, is looking back at me across the water. And not just that you can see someone's outline, but you're looking at their expression. And as we found out in the bar about a week later, both of us thought exactly the same thing at that precise moment, because he looked at me too. And that was, that's really good news. We're going to win a gold medal because he looks terrible. <laughs> now, I'm pretty much done for my time. I'm going to be here for the break after the next uh, session. So if you want to come and find me and ask a question, that's absolutely fine. I'd also love to see my medals again. That would also be good. Thank you very much. Um, but until we meet outside, absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank Done. you. Oh, thank I you. I think Bill wants to say something. Yeah? You can see the video again. Gavin, can we the see the video down, again? I can, I, can, I can tell you where everything happened in the video. Oh, that's awesome. So if you turn the sound, can I, can I talk over the top of the video? Sure. <clears throat> You can stand right there. Ah, that'll help. Okay. So that's Barcelona. That's 25 years ago. That's Atlanta. And that's the Sydney combination. How young do I look there? So Sydney, we won by 0.38. Steve's fifth gold medal. Important to hug him after that moment. And this is the Athens race. So this is about 400 meters, no, 500 meters to go. So we're behind, we're in the yellow boat. And we are half a second behind at this stage. And that's the Canadians who were the world champions in the year before. Apologies to all the Canadians in the room. And it's probably about now that we start saying last 30. So I'm counting strokes now. That's about 25, 1. So with 20 strokes left of our effort, we're back level. We're now down into the teens, and we're inching ahead. But that, that feels like a massive change for us. That's an enormous change in speed, especially at this stage of the race. So Barney is the Canadian on the right there, and that's me in the distance, disappearing off to the left, which is good for me. <laughs> so now we're probably down to the last 10 of our effort, and we get about as much lead about here as we ever get. It's not much. Probably I overestimated it between the desks. It's probably less. It's about that. And then that's about when I have a look and think, well, this isn't quite what I imagined. <laughs> and now they start coming back. Surely, surely they start, there's another look from me. <laughs> and that's the finish line. 